Hi there. Welcome to today's intact session um, on weaving the safety net, collaborating with community partners towards shared outcome. Um, we are so happy that you all are taking the busy time out of your schedules to join us today. Um, before we get started, we have a few housekeeping items that we want to go over, but we would love to learn more about who you are. So if you don't mind taking a minute and just introducing yourself in the chat box with your name, your organization, your role, and where you're located, that would be great. Um, uh, as a part of our session, we must provide you with a disclaimer. This presentation was prepared by NTAC under a co cooperative agreement from SAMHSA. While this event is supported by SAMHSA, the contents are, are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official views of SAMHSA, HHS, or the US government. While we hope there are not any security issues that happen today, in the event that any may occur, this session will immediately close out and you will be notified via email on how to rejoin a new session. Um, I wanna say thank you for attending again. Um, one of our in-text sessions um, listed here are our incredible national partners that we have uh, come together and utilize their expertise and their subject knowledge to help inform the field by creating products, resources, and sessions like this um, to enhance the behavioral and mental health fields. Um, I am Jasmine Boatwright. Hi guys, I am from Youth Move National, one of the uh, groups on this team. Um, our vision and our services. So our vision is that all children, youth, and families living with and impacted by mental health challenges will have access to the resources and opportunities that they need um, to thrive in a comprehensive, comprehensive and equitable system of care. We serve a wide sector audience, including everyone from state leaders, providers, to school workforce, infant, early childhood providers, um, community mental, community-based providers, peer supports, family members, youth partners, you name it. Um, we are definitely uh, trying to have something for everyone. Um, before we get started, we wanted to address some commonly asked questions that come up during our sessions to let you know um, before we get started some of the answers to these questions. In case, um, in, in the follow-up email for today's session, you will receive a certificate of completion and a link uh, to the recording. You will not, for this session, sorry, you will not receive a certificate of completion, but you will um, receive a follow-up with any information that is shared with you today. Um, I think that is it for me. I want to, again, welcome you all to today's session. Um, now that we've made it through some of those housekeeping items, we want to... Um, Go ahead and get started with the Weaving the Safety Net presentation. With that being said, I will go ahead and pass it over to today's presenter. Um, I'll pass it to Catherine to first introduce herself. Thank you, uh, Jasmine. I'm Catherine Grimes. I'm uh, the founder and director of the Children's Health Initiative, um, which is located as part of Cambridge Health Alliance in Cambridge. I'm here with my leadership team that's going to be sharing this presentation, and we're going to be talking about our safety net program funded thanks to SAMHSA's System of Care grant. That's uh, the focus um, of which is on a collaborative practice model with primary care, and that's we're going to be talking a lot about that um, and ways that that can be used as a additional uh, process for supporting youth and families to get mental health care. Next. The Children's Health Initiative mission is to inform children's mental health policy by identifying evidence-based strategies for improving healthcare access and engagement among vulnerable populations at risk for outcome disparities. Next. 
as all of you know, uh, there is a vast need for um, mental health care for youth and children and adolescents in this country. This, these data were pulled before uh, COVID and we are aware that that problem has only escalated in terms of both need being up and capacity being down. At the time that this was gathered, about a fifth of the population of kids in the US were identified as having mental health needs, but only four out of every 20 kids was able to get a mental health evaluation. But our concern goes beyond that, even though that's concerning, which is that we're concerned that when there are evaluations available or even treatment available, uh, there still remain barriers to engagement um, that can limit treatment utilization. Next slide. Barriers to care can lead to premature termination of services, which in itself then goes on to uh, uh, be a risk for undertreatment. Uh, and worsening illness and a poor, poor prognosis. Getting the right fit between families and providers is a two-way street. Sometimes in the past, it was, was a lot of blaming of parents, maybe still, of parents and kids for um, not coming to appointments, but we know that children and caregivers leave treatment for a reason. If providers are not culturally sensitive and the setting is not supportive, key information may not be shared by the child or the caregiver. Next, Jasmine, <laughs> next, thank you. Um, that missing information can contribute to misunderstandings. There can be existing cultural divides, which then go on to lead to incorrect diagnoses and treatment plans, which are likely not to be endorsed or followed by the family. Parents and caregivers often have great trust in their pediatricians or PCPs. We try to leverage that relationship where possible to reach families who currently are not getting mental health care. Earlier recognition of symptoms and supportive expectation from primary care regarding participation in child mental health evaluations can literally save lives. Next. This is a attempt to take a three-dimensional process and flatten it into a two-dimensional process, but the overall idea is that on the far left, um, a uh, pediatrician, family medicine doc, a nurse practitioner uh, can sc screen either through formal measures or informal processes for mental health needs, substance use needs in, in, among their population. And if they need assistance, they refer to us. We are located in the same clinic with the primary care um, clinicians, and we can then respond as a team instead of uh, uh, referrals that might be farmed out to an individual and then a few weeks later another individual we meet as a team with the child and, and uh, family you'll be hearing more about these distinct roles but just to uh, give you a preview there's the family support specialist that's a peer-to-peer -peer parent the child psychiatrist a consultant the clinical care manager who's an LICSW and they each meet with the kid and family in uh, in a combination of ways to um, pull together uh, multiple perspectives. Our aim is to emerge from that experience with uh, shared goals with the family, a shared plan, and uh, uh, investment in a shared outcome. Next slide. Next slide. Thanks. Um, the safety net process is intensive. Uh, it's unlike a regular mental health visit or a regular doctor's appointment, uh, it, it goes on longer and it has a lot more parts. So we jokingly talk about it as a kind of a mix and match where we'll meet with the family and the kid together at the beginning. And then we'll sort of go, take turns pulling the parent aside to meet with the family support person. The kid goes off with the therapist or the, or the uh, child clinician or, and the psychiatrist and then people reconvene. It's a lot of um, trying to hear um, the unique perspective of each family member, but also bring them together. After the evaluation, the interview findings are exchanged among the safety net team members and observations, diagnostic impressions, and treatment ideas are reviewed among the, that, that team, the safety net team. Then with that consensus, we, we uh, reconvene with the parent and youth and talk about these uh, our impressions, he listen to what their concerns and, and, and thoughts are about next steps. And we come up with a ideally a shared youth and family led treatment plan. 
and agreed upon next steps all in place before the end of the session. Next. Uh, now, uh, Lindsay Dabana, who's our uh, clinical director, is going to tell you what how that looks closer to the scene, closer to the action. Take it away, Lindsay. Hi. So today I'll be talking about clinical collaboration strategies in our safety net model. Um, next slide. Oh, no. And specifically the clinical care manager role. So our clinical care managers are child and adolescent trained. They're independently licensed clinical social workers and they're our site-based team leaders. They're fluent with both medical care delivery settings and community-based care. They facilitate communication with patients, primary care clinicians and other members of, child, of the child and family team. And they support engagement with youth and caregivers, persevering with needed follow through in order to facilitate the implementation of the individualized care plans. Next slide. The beginning. So our referrals come directly from primary care. They build upon the deep history and trusting relationships primary care has have with kids and their families. And this provides a big head start on knowledge at the outset compared to typically scant um, psychiatric referral information. Our safety net um, connection to the prime, the safety net connection to the primary care team offers the unique opportunity to increase the comfort level among culturally diverse patient populations regarding meeting with mental health providers, even sometimes for the first time. This also provides a big head start on engagement compared to families having to go to somewhere unfamiliar in order to meet with a mental health clinician. Next slide. So the goals of our safety net our evaluations are to identify the needs and strengths of a child and family, to assess the mental health status and safety of a child, to consult to primary care regarding diagnosis and treatment recommendations, to create individualized care plans with youth and family um, that include safety plans, and to implement agreed upon interventions. And these are agreed upon, as Dr. Grimes is saying, in real time with families in our evaluations in collaboration with system providers and to monitor progress toward shared goals. Uh, next slide. So cultivating continuity of intent. The clinical care manager and the family support specialist work together and separately to create a shared understanding of the strengths and needs of, a, of our families and, and kids. They actively follow up with the child and the caregiver as well as members of the community-based team to build a cohesive, family-driven and individualized care plan with clearly defined goals. This continuity of intent reduces confusion or conflict about recommendations. Families are not, are not told different things by different providers and clarifies roles and action steps for everyone involved. Continuity of intent also allows for agreed upon ways to measure what has been achieved and identify what is still needed. Uh, next slide. Keys to the collaborative practice model. So our safety net team relies upon multimodal communication efforts and mutual support. We are highly connected. Um, this model requires flexibility to adapt to challenging clinical presentations and family circumstances while maintaining forward progress toward goals. It requires stamina to support follow through with treatment recommendations and the creation of opportunities to re-engage with hard to reach families. Primary care is often very important in this um, and to uncover barriers to treatment at the onset. Um, it requires a sense of shared responsibility which reduces clinician burnout and facilitates family engagement as well. So today I'll, I'll start with a case example um, of Tyler, a, a child and Janet, a mom. And these are, are not our patient's real names for confidentiality purposes. Um, but Tyler was referred to our program from his pediatrician. He's a 15 year old black English speaking cisgender male. He lives alone with his mom and has a difficult relationship with his father who was released from prison a few years ago. 
Tyler had been put in, al in an alternative school placement due to smoking marijuana and skipping class. And more recently, he was charged with a felony for stealing a car with his friends and firing a gun. Of note, his doctor had made numerous mental health referrals for anger and attentional issues starting at the age of six, but his family was not able to engage in mental health care beyond intake appointments. Um, we also recognized when we received this referral from the medical chart that there was a pattern of providers in all specialties having difficulty connecting with his mom, Janet, by phone. Next slide. So we received that referral information and then Tyler and his mom were invited in for an evaluation with our team. Um, and these are some of the observations from our clinical care manager. Um, and in particular, observations from the child interview when she had a chance to, to talk individually with Tyler. Tyler presented as regulated, talkative and with appropriate range of affect. He denied depressive or anxiety symptoms. He also denied marijuana use and really minimized concern about his felony charge and the impact of past trauma. His, his presentation was alarmingly incongruent with his current circumstances, being on house arrest due to the felony charge. Janet, his mom, denied concerns that Tyler was getting involved and seemed to be most concerned about whether or not Tyler would be held back in school. Janet's presentation also seemed to minimize the extent of Tyler's safety risks and the need for immediate intervention. So at the, at the end of our evaluation, we meet with families and, and uh, together with the families come up with, with agreed upon interventions. Those intervention, interventions included encouraging Janet, Tyler's mom, to begin communicating with, with providers and, and picking up phone calls. Um, it also included facilitating Tyler's engagement in mental health treatment. He started to meet with a therapist. We helped Janet get connected to a therapist for herself as well. Um, we facilitated regular care planning meetings, and they included a host of important players in Tyler's life, including Janet, Tyler himself, the school district, the alternative placement guidance counselor and teachers, his therapist, his probation officer, and even his lawyer. Um, and we also, we updated some safety plans several times over the year, um, especially after his ankle monitoring device was removed and warning bullets were even file, fired through his bedroom. Um, it was a pretty scary moment for the family and the team, the comprehensive team really rallied behind them. Next slide. So I'm gonna pass it on to our family support specialist program manager, Karen Martinez. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm super excited to be here to talk about the role of the family support specialist in integrated care. Uh, my name is Karen Martinez. I'm the manager of the family support specialist program for the Children's Health Initiative. So a little bit about myself. I am a parent of a child with mental health needs. I know what it's like to be worried and frightened and confused about how to find help for my son or my, for my children. Having lived experience is critical for providing effective family support. Next slide, please. So what is the family support's role in Safety Net's clinical team? Our family support team has lived experience parenting a child with mental health illness. They use their own stories to build trust, provide emotional support, and engage families. They listen for the rest of the story. For example, things that families are less likely to share with a clinician. We provide critical translation between the professional culture and the family's culture to support individualized treatment planning. And we also remain accessible and responsive and persist in efforts to partners, partner with families despite of challenges. Next slide, please. So the family training, the family supports training requires multiple levels. Lived experience is critical for building and trusting mutual respectful relationships with caregivers, but it's just not enough. Peer-to-peer -peer family support 
also need training to tell their stories with a purpose and an intention. We support the family to develop their voice and express their choice to better engage in informed decision-making on behalf of their child and family. Working as a family support specialist in the primary care clinic requires even more training. We facilitate communication in both directions between families and clinicians. We also participate in family advocacy at the policy level. Next slide, please. So family support aims to increase strength and resilience in families to help their children with special needs achieve their full potential. We also aim to create a safe environment in which families can speak honestly about their needs and frustration. And we aim to help parents and caregivers construct an informed, family-driven care plan and individualize with individualized resources. Next slide, please. In summary, we practice a warm, welcoming, culturally sensitive approach. We establish an early connection with the parent, which is key to the process. We assess parent caregiver's readiness. We help identify possible barriers to accessing care. We bring the family's perspective in, in a timely manner to the clinical teams providing integrated care to children and families in primary care. We are a key member building trust and facilitating critical information to and from the family to support treatment recommendations. Next slide, please. So in the context of moving families forward towards change, we do for, we do with, and we cheer on. In the do for process, often families in crisis may arrive weary and need help Family support can be a resource and a model to self-care by connecting around fundamental needs and actively supporting first steps in accessing care. For example, when we do four, we it's sometimes it's just making a simple call for a parent that is in crisis. We do with by prioritizing needs and reflecting on choices with peers and coaching parents on how to take action, such as signing consents for school testing or seeking counseling. We join parents in searching for resources or considering who should be in their child's care plan team. And we cheer on by guiding and educating families through a process, a process that encourages skill building and resilience. Sometimes a child may or may not have changed, but information and self-directed skills can give that parent a new tool to manage those needs. And we join in celebrating the success of empowerment. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so what are our lessons learned? We ask, we share, and we celebrate. We ask parents about their accomplishments we work as we work with them, we ask them what they feel they still may need help with and offer to look for relevant support in an ongoing process. We never leave a, fa a family without a resource. We share observations such as gains we see or progress happening with the child or family. We also share good news with our integrated team. Success strengthens our teams and helps lessons stick as well. We collaborate, I'm sorry, we celebrate the power of families helping families. Next slide, please. In the case example of Tyler and Janet during the safety net evaluation, initially Janet was guarded and very hard to reach by phone. She called to cancel the evaluation, but was supported by family support to attend. The family support is the family's first point of contact when the referral comes in. This helps cultivate a peer-to-peer -peer engagement process. Janet, a little bit about her. She is a single parent struggling to get her child support and wishes for dad to become more involved in Taylor's care. She was fearful and commented, my son is black, is a black male without a role model. He can easily fall into the system. Janet was unsure if and how safety net could help her. Our evaluations provide 
family support time alone with caregivers. And during that intimate time, Janet openly expressed her worries about Tyler and wanting more support. Housing stability was also uncertain. Keeping the family safe was imperative at this time. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Janet and the family support safety net interventions. We focus on trust building with Janet, conducted, from conducting frequent uh, check-ins, including having an active supportive role regarding housing and accessing for, um, assessing for safety. We encourage the use of a clinical therapist for mom and for her to utilize her natural support, which was the grandmother. Janet needed team support for a second time with attending an IEP meeting. Um, prior to this, uh, you may or may not remember us saying that she was pretty quiet in the, um, uh, the first uh, evaluation. Um, but with the family support, help by coaching her on tools to increase the presence of her voice. She prepped with notes and ran the, the meeting herself, almost. <laughs> we also guided Janet to obtain legal advice from an appropriate expert and encouraged Janet to actively communicate and collaborate with clinical team members, including the PCP, Tyler's therapist, system partners such as Housing Authority, Juvenile Justice, and school. Next slide, please. And next, it's Dr. Rafla, Dr. our child psychiatrist, Dr. Rafla. Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, so, hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here and to talk about my role. My name is Melek Rafla. I'm a child psychiatrist. Uh, I work at the Cambridge Health Alliance. I'm also the consulting psychiatrist on the safety net team. And I'll be talking today about this new and different role for child psychiatrists and leveraging <clears throat> integrated teams to improve health outcomes for families, for the families that we work with. <clears throat> so in this role, um, I do a psychiatric evaluation. There, there's a diagnostic workup to with treatment recommendations that our team discusses with the family at the end of the evaluation. I can also make um, recommendations about medications. I can discuss the risks and benefits, address other questions the parent or child may have about that. But I actually do not prescribe to the families that I see through safety net. Um, we can either help connect uh, the patient to a psychiatric prescriber, or sometimes we can ask and work with a child's pediatrician or PCP to see if that uh, clinician could prescribe. Sometimes this also happens with the parent or the guardian, if they are interested in getting help and support for their own, uh, for their own mental health needs. So we can make treatment recommendations for, for them too by getting consent to communicate with their PCPs if they have one. I also offer ongoing consultation and supervision to the rest of the team, the CCMs and the FSS clinicians regarding cases, if any questions about like treatment recommendations, in addition to collaborating with various institutions and agencies, whether they're schools, um, child protective services, the juvenile justice system, mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> slide, please. Dr. Rafla, um, you were, you're muted. This last, okay. last slide, we missed you. There we go. Okay. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> Um, so this is my favorite slide. It demonstrates one of the key issues that uh, access, uh, that our families um, have strong challenges with. Access to mental health care is one of the biggest challenges that the general population has, but it's actually an even bigger problem for vulnerable populations. 
low SES families, communities of color, immigrant undocumented families, non-English speaking families. And what I wanted to highlight also is that our service, the safety net approach, it's mainly for families in complex cases with multiple psychosocial needs, legal needs, medical needs, psychiatric needs, school issues. It's not a treatment for everyone. It's, it's a treatment approach that helps uh, those who have multiple problems that interfere with a family accessing support. Uh, particularly uh, high needs families that are at risk for falling through the cracks. And essentially what we do is we help pave the way or guide our clients. We were essentially this yellow ramp that you see in front of you that offers an equitable interface with these folks and acts so they can access healthcare and social supports. Uh, next slide. So I'm also um, a regular outpatient child psychiatrist at the hospital where I work, in addition to this role that I have with SafetyNet. And I would like to highlight to you all some of the similarities and differences in these two roles. So in both roles, I do a psychiatric assessment along with a treatment plan with recommendations. I'll even make referrals, that sort of thing. However, with SafetyNet, there's a lot more of what we call like behind the scenes work that we do. And that involves working with the family to help them navigate these systems that are frequently very complicated to understand and access. I spend more time working with the parent or the guardian, and I even meet with them without the child present thanks to the setup of our evals because we have a CCM and FSS present too. So that gives me a really good opportunity to get a lot of background and collateral from the parent. <clears throat> um, and as was mentioned previously, the FSS clinician is the first point of contact with the families. So when they come to meet with me and the CCM, they already have a, a connection with the FSS. And that really helps the eval become a successful one. It facilitates the development of a strong working alliance with the parent and the child all about that connection and access. Um, next slide, please. Yes. Uh, so with this team-based approach, I'm able to cover a lot more in that psychiatry consult than I can in a traditional outpatient one. We, we meet with our clients at the PCP office. So it's not at a specialty clinic. It's where they're most familiar, what they're most familiar with. Also, the PCP staff know us well, and they know how to reach us and can easily access us for curbsides or warm handoffs or if they have questions about referrals. The evaluation is done with both myself or like the consulting child psychiatrist, complex care manager, and the family support, uh, family support specialist present throughout the whole eval. And this setup facilitates a lot, an exchange of a lot of important information uh, with real-time supervision for all of us. We also do a lot of EHR, uh, electronic health record-based communication with the referring providers or PCPs. So we're really good at knowing how to use the information and share it with the, with the important stakeholders involved in the care of this child within the healthcare system and outside of it such as schools, uh, other agencies, if you will. Knowledge is power, even here. Um, so this leads to better communication with a PCP because we share the work, the burden, particularly with these complex cases where you can feel that where they feel much more manageable. And in turn, all of us feel much more supported and less likely to burn out when you know the, the, the cases are just really difficult. Uh, next slide. Okay. <clears throat> so um, with our approach, families get a psychiatry appointment quicker with this setup. And the consult occurs you know, with the CCM, the social worker. There's more investment with staff and with time at the beginning of this process. We really front load and invest a lot at the beginning in terms of spending a lot of time 
having all hands on deck to, to really foster that initial engagement. And that's very important, um, especially for families with complex and multiple psycho, psychosocial needs. And this is much more effective than a split treatment model. But what we also do is they have something called huddles. And what that is, is we can take time in the middle of the evaluation to discuss a case amongst ourselves. We have the family in another room and we discuss before the final recommendations. And this is really helpful when you're working with complex cases because it gives you more time to think, it gives you more time to get supervision in a real time way to make a timely intervention now, not like two weeks later or come back, you know, and we'll figure out something. You can, you can have the family leave with more effective recommendations. So the initial eval is a much more intensive, profound, and longer eval than, than typical ones. But this gives us and the families more opportunity to develop a connection and to understand what's going on. And after that initial evaluation is done, our FSS staff does a follow-up uh, outreach uh, attempt with the family a few days later to keep that momentum going and to further establish a working alliance uh, with the family. We also continue to discuss cases in our various supervision groups and with assistant partners, and that's throughout the whole work week. So it doesn't even stop once that evaluation is done. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so at Cambridge Health Alliance um, in Cambridge, Mass, we serve a large immigrant population. They constitute somewhere between 30 to 45% maybe even a little bit more than that of our target treated population. Uh, they're primarily from Central America, Southern America, including Brazil. We have a big uh, Brazilian community in the Caribbean as well, Haiti. Uh, immigrant populations have unique needs uh, that put them at an even higher disadvantage than their non-immigrant counterparts. They may be also at higher risk for mental health disorders and, but they also have a much bigger barrier than their non-immigrant counterparts when it comes to having access to health care. And that's due to multiple factors. Now, this is a big generalization. You know, immigrant communities are not one homogenous group, but there are some, there are some like universal common factors that we can keep in mind and, and say. Uh, stigma around mental health, for example, is one of them. Or... Um, uh, communicating uh, mental health distress in a, to, in a primary care setting and physical symptoms or going to your medical doctor instead of knowing that it's more effective to request specialty care. Um, so these are some things uh, where we act as sort of spokespeople or uh, advocates to the families that we work with. Um, next slide, please. So um, I'll talk um, about the family that we consulted on earlier, the, clin the same clinical vignette. So when I met with them, here are some of the um, points that I noticed and I thought were most relevant. The mother was very worried about her son that he'd be getting into more trouble recently, uh, particularly with legal trouble. But she also felt that he'd been lying more to her, stealing from her even. So there was that loss of trust within the family system, very destabilizing. She suspected he was smoking marijuana, maybe even other things as well. She was worried he was getting involved, you know, with a bunch of peers that might have been gang involved or something like that. She also thought that he could be depressed or there was something else like some psychiatric thing going on with him. He, on the other hand, kept saying that he's fine. He was closed off. He said he was okay. The one thing he did admit to though, was that he was upset that he had to get transferred from his original school to a different school. And he wished he could go back to his original school. And that was one of the big ins that we were able to have with him at that initial meeting. Whatever you get, just kind of like use it to engage and connect with your clients. We also noted that his father hadn't been present for most of his life growing up. 
and had sort of come back into the picture about two years prior to our eval, but that was not going well at all. The father wasn't very consistent in his relationship with this young man and not on the same page with the mother about how to parent him. The parents also seemed to argue a lot and um, that seemed to get this youth kind of caught in the middle. I also noticed after reviewing his medical record that he had a history of getting referred to mental health services since he was five years old, but he was not getting any sort of follow-up with those referrals, or he would sort of get lost or fall through the cracks. I also noted that he had a very long history of very aggressive and externalizing behavior outbursts. So even though he was telling me that he was fine or presenting in this very calm manner, I can tell or predict that there was a lot more going on with him inside and he was just not ready to you know bring that up so you work with what you've got um next slide please um so one of our big goals uh, particularly with this family at the initial meeting was to try and address this and prevent um that falling through the cracks or not getting being able to get connected to therapy uh from happening this time so we really focused hard and long on developing that working alliance with him and the mother. I even tried to see if we could include the father, but we weren't able to do that, unfortunately. We set up, we set a goal of helping him out with his school situation, you know, finding the best placement for him, supporting his mother with the IEP, reviewing it with the school. He was open to getting connected uh, with an outpatient therapist. And we were able to find what we think was a good fit for him. And luckily, it was someone in-house within our agency that we could coordinate a lot with. We also did a lot of coordination with his probation officer in court to support him with the charges that he was facing and to try to see if we can get that GPS monitor uh, removed. So that was all during our initial eval. Six months later down the road uh, at our follow-up uh, consultation, he actually seemed to be liking his new school more and was not as adamant about wanting to go back to his previous school. Good. He was also connected with an outpatient therapist and had been consistent with this person since we made the initial referral about six months earlier. And this, in my mind, was the biggest success. He didn't fall through the cracks this time. He engaged in the treatment and he was actually going consistently for the most part with this clinician and engaged in services. At the six month, he mentioned a few more goals, such as wanting to find a job, you know, make some money, get connected with some sort of like youth empowerment program. So we worked with him on trying to help with that. Um, and then at the 12 month, at our final sort of consultation, or a year long sort of service, um, we end after 12 months, he was still in therapy, huge success, and he was working on a lot of stuff with his clinician. He was happier with the school. And at this point, he was wanting to continue there till he graduated. There was no more talk about wanting to go back. He was thriving. So uh, as we were ending, we agreed to get the family additional supports. And that included things such as in-home family therapy, so he could focus on some of the issues between him and his mother, maybe even the father at some point an intensive care coordinator to support them with all the various agencies and appointments uh, that they were still dealing with. And finally, a therapeutic mentor. So he could have more of a positive male role model that, um, that could work well. And I believe that's all my slides. Thank you. So oh, hello, everybody. Um, we So I'm going to give you a quick summary on what did we learn so far. This is a um, process that's ongoing, so we'll keep on learning. Uh, next slide. One of the things that we do with all the kids coming in is um, get a uh, score of adverse childhood experiences. We're, our concern is that childhood trauma is uh, often goes unrecognized in also in primary care. And by our finding out about it sooner, we can help with prevention where there's um, ongoing risk and healing where there's past risk. 
the average childhood experiences um, have uh, a, a variety of opinions about them. There's concerns. Uh, sometimes people want to make sure that we understand that ACEs are not destiny, as they say. And certainly, I agree with that completely. But it's also been my experience that um, if we're unaware of trauma, uh, we're not always treating the right issue. In our um, population, what we've seen so far is, which is not a selected population for trauma, they just we just take whoever the pediatrician has send us, the average score is 5.3, which is very high. Uh, so to our mind, it shows that we're reaching, um, I guess, the right families and kids. Um, next slide. Next, yeah, thanks. The demographics for our population so far um, is a work in progress, but we have a uh, majority Latinx population self-identified in terms of ethnicity. On the race just question, um, we had 48% people identifying as white, 25% identifying as black, mixed race is seven, and declined was 20%, but actually on drilling down about that, uh, twenty percent. The um, majority of those people had already identified as Latinx and were um, didn't feel that they needed to check another box. It's it's a this is a case where measurement is behind in terms of uh, how uh, uh, cultural change. On the gender side, we have forty eight percent of the kids referred are female, forty seven are male. And in the uh, sort of evolving third category at this point of non-binary kids, we have um, 5%. Caregiver language, the, just over the majority, just over 50% are English speaking, but we have uh, 49% non-English speaking. You can see that distribution primarily as Spanish and followed by Portuguese. Next slide. Next, there we go. Uh, we look also are looking at engagement as one of one of our outcomes. And uh, as you heard about with Tyler, with his multiple referrals and um, not getting treatment, this was the case for the bulk of the kids that we have been referred so far. They have they have gotten they've been noticed, but they um, and, and referrals have been made, but care didn't happen. Um, within the safety net population of these very same kids, what we're seeing now is that 67% of the kids referred have actually and their families enrolled and participated in the program. 89% are still engaged, 89 of those 67, at the six month interval and 75% so far have completed the full 12 month program. Next slide. Next slide, thanks. So what happened to Tyler and Janet? Next slide. This is gonna be, uh, Lindsay's gonna tell you more about from the clinical care manager perspective. Hi again. So as, as Dr. Rochla was saying, after a year, Tyler really opened up to his therapist about his anxiety he be, and his worries about his safety in the community and his future. He thrived in his out of district school placement. He finally began making academic progress, really received regular positive feedback from teachers um, and will be there the, the, fall, the next year as well. Tyler's attorney was able to advocate for him not to be sen sentenced to juvenile detention because of his participation in school and therapy. And he's likely to get probation instead which is a huge outcome. And as, as tensions increased with the court date looming, Janet, his mom, became much more willing to, uh, to acknowledge parenting challenges and to ask for appropriate help from the team, um, which was also a, a big change from the beginning of our, our work with this family. Both Tyler and Janet presented as less vigilant, less emotionally detached, and demonstrated more self-agency. Um, so both made strides in terms of their, their trauma symptoms. Um, next slide. I'll pass it back to, to Karen yeah. or Tina. Thank you, Lindsay. So 12 months later, the highlights of the 12 months later, um, Janet came prepared with questions and actively participated in her son's second IEP. Um, she was engaged into her, into her own mental health treatment 
Janet also participated in PEL, which is the Parent Professional Advocacy League's Juvenile Justice Basics 101. It was a virtual parent, parent group. Um, the FSS assisted in getting Janet a free uh, safe link phone for added safety. Uh, FSS also facilitated transportation support via PT1 application for therapy and PCP visits. The family support specialist connected Janet to SNAP and unemployment benefits to help her financially. Next slide. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Our conclusions are that uh, ongoing collaboration has uh, with the PCP by the clinical care manager and the child psychiatry consultant helps clarify diagnosis and increases the PCP awareness and support for the individualized care plans. Historically, uh, primary care docs would uh, feel very, very left out of, of mental health care and weren't sure how to support their patients and the families. Building in the key role of family support specialists at the beginning enhances family engagement, helping to create and sometimes mend the safety net. We're all really clear that this uh, wouldn't be possible without this new role of family support specialist. Clinical trial research studies contribute to an emerging, emerging evidence base for the value of peer-to-peer -peer parent support, which should obviously be paid positions um, by insurance companies and not just grant funded, um, and the value of team-based integrated care. Uh, next slide. Pilot data suggests the safety net collaborative practice model has the potential to improve child mental health care access and engagement rates in populations at risk for disparities. Early research suggests savings in total medical expense, e.g. Um, lower uh, emergency room use for intervention use versus comparison data of, of comparable use. Meanwhile, reduced time to treatment has a chance to lessen the morbidity burden of childhood trauma or emerging mental illness, and if so, as we tell all our policy leaders that we get to talk to, then better care would more than pay for itself. Um, thank you very much. And we're very interested in your questions and discussion comments. Jen, you have some um, items from the chat you want to tell us about? Sure. So one question was more logistically um, asking where do the meetings take place, the evaluations in the PCP office or an exam room, and how does that work? Yeah, so the short answer to that, because I know there are more complicated questions as well, the one it's time for is, uh, that's a good question. They are in the PCP clinics, and we totally use um, um, exam rooms as it, it frequently. And what, what we've learned from the families is that this is a place they're used to being. It's a place they feel safe um, and they're fine with being in an exam room. And sometimes we get a uh, conference room available if we have a larger group, but um, there's, a, there's a comfort about being in the tried and true primary care setup that uh, we've learned helps people share information. And what else, Jan? Another question was, um, what are the sorts of outcomes you are capturing? So um, the premise of, of, of our uh, system of care application, I think somebody else said, how is this paid for? At this point, we, we just, I'll take that on as built into that um, other question. Um, we, we bill, uh, we don't, Cambridge Health Alliance bills um, Medicaid as they would for any of these services that are billable. The services that are not currently billable, which would be the family support specialists or this um, time spent in huddles, as uh, Dr. Raffler was speaking about, or all the community outreach time at, uh, at great length that the clinicians uh, go to the clinical uh, care managers, those, those are resourced by the grant. The outcomes we're looking for are what does this help access? And um, I think I saw some other question that I want to build in here too about um, everybody. Dr. Rothler tried to talk a bit about how he 
he works in two places uh, at least at and can compare he's the same guy it's not like he gets extra special when he comes to <laughs> to, to work with safety net he's the same guy uh, Lindsay has lots of experience doing outpatient um, mental health services as a as, as a regular social worker and I certainly do in terms of my own clinical background and so our our what's clear to us and we may not have been that clear with you but is it's the model that's different we are just ourselves but the opportunity opportunity to be able to collaborate with primary care, the opportunity to have families texting the family support specialists, um, the opportunity to work the way we are with schools and DCF, uh, the child welfare organization, are, um, that's what's made, that's what makes a difference. So we're looking at access and engagement. And because all policy parties then want to know what it costs, we also look at expense. And we obviously um, want to hear uh, the care experience. So we have special um, processes and measures to be capturing uh, youth and family care experience along the way too. Those are our outcomes. What else? Jen, do you want to, are there any other ones you've uh, plucked? Um, um, another um, was, how did you get started partnering with community partners and what were any lessons learned in that process? Yeah, that's a great question because um, it's almost a circle, like you can almost start anywhere. But I think what I would advise people if it's not, if you're, if you're, it's a new community for you or it's a new process is in our, I think um, the kid uh, led us to the, to the linkages that we needed to prioritize around that in kids' individual needs. So we, we didn't know all these primary care people when we started. We know a lot of them now, but we got to know them because a certain doctor would refer the kid, then we would have to be in touch with the doctor. We'd learn about that doctor. But we also learned like, oh, this is where the kid goes to school and they're having an issue with school. So we now we have to call the school. Somebody asked about, do we have releases? Yeah, we, we get releases in the very first evaluation, but we would get releases for anything that we can possibly come up with that, you know, that they're telling us about that we need where we would want to contact. So then we learn about that school and then uh, we, we learn about a particular social or uh, child welfare worker. And we might get that person again, then a second time with a different family. And we sort of build outward from kid by kid, a, uh, a, a very uh, organic community-based set of resources. And, and then we kind of discover something else along the way that some family might tell us about and we add them. So it's, um, I've been in other settings where there's a long um, uh, two-year process of, of getting to know all the all the likely candidates for um, within the system of care, and then adding in the kids. But we didn't have that kind of um, time frame with this project, so we had to just start being responsive to primary care, and then we we're we're learning the community more and more every day. What else, Jen? Um, another question just came in. What is the difference between this and CFTs where the care manager implements wraparound at a CMO where they also have an FSO? A lot of acronyms there. Acronyms. I think that might be child and family teams. It might be the CFT, but uh, maybe the questioner can clarify if that's um, what they mean. Um, and then CMO, yeah, we do need an acronym translator, but um, one thing that's different for me than other system of care work that I've done is, and I, I think it's um, different for most, is that it's really, we are located in the primary care clinic. So we aren't sending people to a mental health location. Um, and I've, I've done it both ways. And I've been, I've been in a mental health location and tried to partner with primary care from that direction. It uh, was much less successful. They just didn't really have time. Um, the, when we're right there on site, it makes it a whole lot easier to uh, be available for what we call warm handoffs, easy, like contact in the hallway if we need it. And uh, and we we uh, something I don't know if we made clear, but we carry these cases. I think Malek talked about we have a twelve month as all of, all the system of care grantees do. It's a twelve month uh, opportunity to make to to do what we can for them and with with the kids and families. So we it's not a consulting where it's a one-off we just have an opinion and we we disappear we're, we're we maintain a relationship um for the duration as best we can thank you so much whoops can't hear you Jasmine. oh no i was muted 
Hi, I'm back. Um, <laughs> thank you so much to the entire team. Um, this was an amazing presentation. We are at time. I really appreciate all of the great questions that came in through the chat box. We had a lot of participation today. Sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions. Um, we will, again, if you all um, missed anything, please uh, keep your eye out for a follow-up email about today's session where you'll get some information and a, a link to the recording. Um, yeah, and I wanna thank you all for coming and I don't wanna hold you up, but until next time, I'll see you all soon. Thank you, Jasmine. Bye. Bye-bye.